Good morning. Good morning. Hey, there we are. There we are. So good to see everyone here. Welcome to November. We have made it. Welcome to Communion Sunday here with us today as we celebrate the Lord's table. I'm so glad to have many of you here. So just a few announcements here today. Um, Operation Christmas Child is going forth. You can see the boxes in the back. You can pick those up. Um, there's also some goodies that are back there on the table, I believe, that were um, sewn up. You're welcome to grab some of those to put in your box. Um, so take a look at the back table on your way out today. And uh, I think we're collecting these back. Is it November 15th? Boxes are due back here so that we can load them up and get them, get them out. So looking forward to doing that as well. Um, this Monday, there will be no digging deeper. Dave's class will not be meeting this Monday, so just make sure you make a note of that. Um, if you show up here, no one will be here. <laughs> so, uh, isn't it nice to have the extra hour this morning? I was like, it was really nice, yeah. Just thought I'd mention that. Um, also, you look through there, um, office hours are now Monday through Friday, 12.30 to 4. So if you're needing uh, assistance from the church office, um, Kirby will be happy to be there and talk to you then. Um, also, we just wanted to offer our condolences to the Johnston family with the passing of uh, Lorraine this last week. So those were all in the announcements. If you're not getting the weekly email, we call the MailChimp. Um, you can tell Kirby in the office between 1230 and 4, Monday through Friday. She'll be happy to get you on that list for that as well. Okay, well, I think we have an Operation Christmas Child. So I'll step away and we'll watch that. So we ask, you know, it's just a small box with a few things in it, right? But is it impactful? It touches my heart watching something like that. It's truly amazing. I have you guys stand with me at this time as we go through this month's memory verse. And since we're uh, such nice um, congregation here, it's going to look somewhat familiar to you. Maybe. Maybe it'll look familiar. Maybe it won't. Um, we're working on it, I think. <laughs> well, we all know the first part, right? Oh, it's coming. I promise. We're going to be uh, adding on a verse to uh, 316. Um, we're going to be doing 17 as well this month. So here we go. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All right, we're going to do it one more time. You got this. All right, here we go. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Fantastic. Okay. If you'll remain standing as we read from God's holy word today, which will be Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge and of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the reading of God's sacred and holy word this morning. 
Let us pray together for the service here. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, today we give you all the praise and glory. We are thankful for your sovereignty here and in our lives. Father, we seek to build up and equip one another for the work of the ministry. Please fill us with the spirit that we may attain the unity of the faith to mature in the knowledge of the Son of God. Father, this life at times, it, it seems turbulent. But you, God, speaking in truth and love from your word, helps us grow every way into your Son. He is our solid rock, truly, in which we can stand firm. So, Father, I'd like to offer a prayer for this nation for this upcoming week. Father, I ask for unity in this time, for civility. Ultimately, Father, for your will to prevail. Father, we pray for revival in this country. Father, this morning we're thankful for that prayer your son taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing praises to the Lord. We prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Wonderful privilege we have once again to come to the Lord's table. Highlight, I trust, of, uh, of your month, of our time together as those who, are, who love the Lord Jesus Christ. As our folks come to prepare, our deacons and deaconesses, we uh, will ask uh, once again that um, we try and maintain distance as we come. We'll have some ushers this time who will dismiss by rows from the side to come forward and then go back down the middle to... Uh, wherever you are uh, seated in the balcony, um, we've got it somewhere up there. I'm not sure exactly where. You're, oh, there we are, straight back. And Elizabeth will be there to help you there. Oh, yes, would we please like to dismiss the children, just like we do every week, <laughs> sooner or later. All right. Let's pray together before we... And our Father, as we bow before you this morning, uh, we recognize that this will be a momentous week. It uh, certainly does not escape our attention that in our land there will be an election. There will be an election which is, um, I think, clearly uh, pits those who stand for the truths and the values and the ways of life that reflect your character against those who have gone far beyond those and turned your whole word upside down. And so we have the opportunity at least to cast our vote and ask that you will help the result to come out in favor of those who would honor you and who would at least at some level, none being perfect, but would protect the rights, the liberties that we have enjoyed as a nation, and that's important. You've asked us to pray for that, as not for our, our own sake and comfort, although that certainly is a byproduct, but for the sake of the gospel, that the gospel may go forward without hindrance. And so we pray for that. But Lord, above all, I pray that everyone here this morning has already sworn their allegiance to the greater king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords about whom we have just sung. Such a beautiful song to remind us that whatever else is going on in the world, however an election might come out, our stance is firm, our course is fixed, our trust in you is undiminished. And our desire to see you exalted is greater than ever. 
And so as we come before this table this morning, we thank you that the same one who has led this table since the night you first initiated it with those apostles back in Jerusalem is the same one who hosts this table today. Not in physical form today, but spiritually very definitely. So thank you for being here. Thank you that the day is coming when we will be with you. It won't be long. Be with you in glory and we'll experience this together. You've said you're not going to drink of the fruit of the vine again until you drink it with us in glory. So what a time that will be. How we look forward to that. So as we remember, we also look forward. We pray that in these moments you will help us to First of all, examine our own hearts and lives, Lord, for the things that need to change, the grudges that we're hanging on to, the secret sins that nobody knows about that need to be confessed again and left behind. All of the ways in which we do not reflect your character, we pray that you will cleanse us, forgive us, and help us as we move forward to do better this week than we did last. And then we pray, Father, with great praise and thanksgiving that you are in charge. Everything is under your control. We are grateful for that. And these are the things that we celebrate as we celebrate together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The night that he was crucified, Jesus took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup after supper and said, this is my body given for you. This is my, um, th this cup is my new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Our Father, we thank you for the remembrance for this, for this ordinance that you've given us to help us Remember the price of our redemption. It cost us nothing but cost you everything. Somehow, Lord, help us to realize that represents, that should tell us something about the depth of our hmm, problem, the depth of our lostness. But it also tells us much about the height of your love how much you would give in order to give us the opportunity to come to faith in you and have sins forgiven, hearts cleansed, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so grateful and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read this morning from 1 Timothy chapter 4 as we continue our study there. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12, <clears throat> Paul says, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but let set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Small amount of phraseology there, but a lot to consider. I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, I used to be confused. Now, I'm just not sure. Um, not exactly what we'd like to see in a leader, right? And certainly not in church leaders. There are always details that are going to be confusing somewhat and difficult to deal with. But when it comes to church, beloved, the priorities of leadership are very, very clearly spelled out in the Bible and in the New Testament. And here... In 1 Timothy 4, verses 11 through 16, Paul is giving Timothy his priorities as a pastor and as an elder. 
verses 11 through 13, he deals with his priorities toward the congregation. In verses 13, 14 through 16, he deals with his priorities toward himself. And we as a congregation need to be sure, and we as leaders need to be sure that we're faithful to these priorities as a congregation to insist on these in our leaders. And I think we'll also find that there is very strong application here for all of us. The truth is, this is for leaders, but we're all leaders in some sense somewhere. If leading, leadership is, in, is, is influence, exhibiting or exerting influence, which it is, then we're all leading somewhere. We're in a family, we're leading husband, wife, leading children, we're leading friends. We all have influence. And so while the principles here are specific to church leaders, they have great application beyond that. Two priorities for a pastor in verses 11 through 13, to lead and to feed. Really not very difficult to say, but sometimes they're not very easy to do. To provide direction for a church and to teach the word. Let me tell you, beloved, if, we, if we're confused there, we'll be confused everywhere. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, 16, for those who guide this people have been leading them astray. And those who are guided by them are swallowed up. In other words, confused leadership leads to confused people, and in fact, it leads to destroyed people. God says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 9, it shall be like people like priests. In other words, if the leaders get it wrong, so will the people. And there are consequences. He says in verse 6 of Hosea 4, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Leaders who are not following the priorities that God had laid down. If the leaders get it wrong, everybody pays. And so as leaders in the church and as leaders anywhere else that we have influence, there is great lesson for us here. Now, the flip side to all of that is if we get it right, then the people likely will as well. All of us tend to grow into the pattern of those under whom we put ourselves as leaders. So there's application here for all of us. We're going to see today what it means for a pastor to lead, an elder to lead. Next week, we're going to look at what it means to feed. Three things that he identifies here about leadership that are important. How to lead. Number one, Timothy is to lead with authority. He is to lead with authority. Notice what he says there in verse 11. He says, command and teach these things. Now, it's not dialogue and debate. There's a place for that. But when it comes to leaders and the way that they get the word of God across, the, com the command is to command and teach these things. Later on in 2 Timothy 4, Paul's going to tell Timothy, Preach the word. He has a responsibility, and it is to lead with authority. In other words, God is saying here to, through Paul, Timothy, God has put you in that position, so put aside your natural timidity and lead with authority. Command. It's a present imperative. It means it's a command. Keep on commanding. Present tense. It's a strong word. He's been told to avoid silly myths, and he's been told to train himself or nourish himself for godliness. In other words, nourish himself on the word so that he's living a godly life and now he's to command others to do the same. He's to lead with authority. These orders apply not only to Timothy but to all elders for all time and even to all Christians. This contrasts so sharply with so much that is, that is done today in the name of preaching. We have preaching which is often intriguing but seldom commanding, often entertaining but seldom, seldom convicting, popular but not powerful, maybe worst of all interesting sometimes but not transforming. Why? Because we're not leading with authority. Timothy's not out, out there to give advice. He's there to command. And the things that he commands are the things that he's been nourishing himself on from the word. His authority isn't his own. It's not his own opinions. His authority isn't self-generated. 
His authority comes from the fact that he's teaching and preaching the word of God. As Luther and the Reformers used to say, when we look at the word of God, we are seeing the words of God. And that's what every teaching ought to be. It comes from the word. Authority comes from the word. Faithful servant boldly confronts sin and unbelief. Disobedience without wavering or without favoritism. Listen to some of the things that he says in these pastoral epistles. 1 Timothy 1.3, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. 1 Timothy 5.7, command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17, Timothy is to charge and it's the same word. Charge the rich not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Now, it's true that, you know, we must never be harsh in the way we do this or ungracious. Boldness has to be tempered with gentleness. But good preaching and good teaching never lack authority when they're coming from the word of God. Richard Baxter, the great Puritan, said it this way. He said, our job is to screw the truth into men's minds. I like the way he said that. First of that means it has to be screwed into our mind and then passed on to others. Haddon Robinson, um, he's, he's really probably for the last half at least of the 20th century, he was kind of the guy when it came to how do you preach the, the, the good seminaries would use his books, particularly one of them that was specific to how to preach the word of God. And he was well respected as kind of the leader in that field. He said this, he said, pastors are pressured to deliver some message other than scripture, a political system, a new religious philosophy, or a trend in psychology. And when they don't preach the word, they abandon their authority. They fail to confront their hearers with a word from God. That is why most modern preaching evokes little more than a wide yawn. God is not in it. That's, that's tragic, is it not? It's tragic. And it's happening all across our country and across our world. When we preach less than the gospel, when we preach something other than the word, we've departed from our God-given responsibility to command and teach these things. I love how Spurgeon said it. One of his most withering criticisms he took as the greatest compliment he ever got. Somebody said about Spurgeon, here's a man who's not moved one inch forward in all his ministry and at the close of the 19th century is teaching the theology of the first century. May his tribe increase, right? That's exactly where we should be. So he's to lead, he's to lead with authority. Secondly, he is to lead with confidence. He's to lead with confidence. Timothy's in his late 30s by the time this is written. He's kind of young for a leader. He's mid to, mid to late 30s. And Paul says, let no one despise you for your youth. Okay. But how do I do that? You can't, you can't, can't very well, Timothy might have said, I can't very well go grab somebody by the lapels and say, hey, listen, you. I hear you've been saying things about me behind my back. That's going to end here and now or there are going to be consequences. Probably wouldn't work very well, right? Wouldn't have the desired effect. So how is he to do this? Well, Paul's answer is simply this. Reflect maturity in your actions. Just because you're young in age, you don't have to be young in the way that you behave, in the way that you live your life. If others will not respect your youth, but you're living out your faith, then the problem is with them, not with you. He's saying lead with confidence, Timothy. God put you there. Act with humility, but act with confidence and maturity. Don't let anybody, don't give anybody reason to diminish you because you're acting a fool. Paul said concerning Timothy in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 10, he was 
writing to Corinthians, he said, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of God, as I am. So let no one despise you. So, you know, Paul knew Timothy. He knew he wasn't as forceful as, or as bold as Paul, but he could be confident in, his, in, in the way that he acted. He could be confident knowing that God put him there, and it was his responsibility to learn the word of God, to live the word of God. And if he would do that, people would have no excuse to look down on his youth. You know, the world says, believe in yourself. Does it not? How many times have you heard that? From the time I was a kid, believe in yourself. Here's what God says. Proverbs 28, verse 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. What is wisdom? The word of God. That's where the authority comes from. That's where the confidence comes from. You know you have truth when you're there. Proverbs 3, verse 26, for the Lord will be your confidence. It's said by the wisest man who ever lived, his confidence was in the Lord, not in himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Do you see the, you see the pattern here? The pattern is when you're speaking the word of God, when you're living the word of God, when you're being in the word of God and it is part of everything you do, then there is your confidence. That's what he's telling Timothy. I want you to live that way. God is our rock, not ourselves. You know, when they... Construction began on the Golden Gate Bridge in 1932. The expectation was that they would probably lose about, about one man in, in death because of the hazardous conditions for every million dollars they spent on that bridge. But they decided to add some new safety measures, even though there was some cost attached to that. So they did some things that made sense, mandatory hard hats, you know, the guys were still he-men in those days. They didn't always wear them. Now they had to wear them if they were going to get paid. Tie-off lines they were required to use. But probably the biggest help of all was a safety net. They put a safety net about 60 feet below the working area, covering the whole area. It cost almost, it will cost over $100,000 in those dollars to put that safety net in place. But they figured over the four years that that bridge was in building, at least 19 lives were saved. Those guys that fell into that, they called them the halfway to hell club. Because without that safety net, well, that's where they'd have been, depending on their faith. So they had confidence. They figured that they were 25% more efficient because of that net. Well, beloved, that's our, con our confidence is in God, right? Our confidence is that we're living in, in accordance with the, with the word of God. And when we're doing that, when we're living our life in prayer, when we're bathing our life in the word of God and we're solid in what we know that we believe and we're constantly learning more, we can, we can lead with confidence. So Paul tells Timothy, I want you to lead with confidence. I don't care about your age. You need to be confident. Then thirdly, here's the greatest leadership principle that there is. There's no greater one than this. I don't care whether it's church, whether it's secular, where you're at. This is the greatest leadership principle of all. You lead by example. Lead by example. Paul says in verse 12, let no one despise your youth, but set the believer's an example. How do you focus away from your youth? Don't just talk about maturity. Live it. Live it. Live it in front of the people. Let them see it. Show them. The greatest leadership principle of all, lead by example. Like Jesus. When his disciples needed a lesson in humility, what did he do? Give them a message on humility. You know what he did in John 13. He stripped himself down to the clothes of a slave. He got down and began to wash their feet. Why? 
because they were arguing at that very moment about who was the greatest, who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who was going to have the highest position in the kingdom. That was their mindset. They needed a lesson in humility. So what did Jesus do? He gave them an example. Then he said, as I have done to you, so you should do to each other. He led by example. Peter got it. It's powerful. Peter writes later in 1, Timothy 5, 1 Peter 5, 2, he says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. In Titus 2, 7, Paul says to Titus, show yourself in all respects to be a model of what? Good works. How do you lead? By example. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul itemizes many of the persecutions that he went through, all the things that he suffered. And then he says to the Corinthians, I urge you then, be imitators of me. Wouldn't you think he'd say be imitators of Christ? But see, they didn't have Christ in the flesh. They had Paul. He said, be imitators of me. Second Thessalonians 3, 7, he says, you ought to imitate us. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Philippians 3.17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In other words, follow my example. That's pretty bold, isn't it? I, that, to me, that's scary bold. What would Paul think? Do you think he was perfect? No. Paul knew he wasn't perfect. He says in Philippians 3, verse 12, not that I am already perfect. He knew he wasn't, but he, was, he knew what he was aiming for. That's where he was headed. That was his goal. He knew he was doing everything, disciplining his life, bringing it under submission so that he could honestly say to others, imitate me like I imitate Christ. He knew he wasn't perfect, but he knew he could give an example, and it was his job to give an example, that God expected him to give an example, and so he did. And he urged others to follow. If we're not doing the same thing, if we're not able to say, honestly, I want you to imitate me, we're probably not ready for leadership. Let's reconsider what the example of our life says to others around us, because believe me, beloved, the ones that you're influencing are taking their lesson not from what you say, but from what you do. Be examples. Well, then to make sure Timothy gets the idea, Paul gives him several areas in which to be an example. He starts with speech. I think it's an interesting, interesting that he starts with. Jesus said we'll all give account for every careless word. I mean, that, we should, probably should have that pinned up over a mirror on the refrigerator or something, right, to remind us every single day we're going to count. Every one of them is going to be played back to us one day. Does that change how you talk? We're going to give an example. We're, we're going to give account for every foolish word. We're going to give account for every trivial word, for every harsh word, for every intolerant word, for every angry word, for every critical word, for every complaining word. Tough, isn't it? Proverbs says a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 12, I didn't look up the verse, but it talks about how the words, the, the soft words are healing words. The other ones send a spear or an arrow right through someone. Henry Ward Beecher once said, speak when you are angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. Anybody ever been there? Speak when you're angry, and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. Be an example in words. Lincoln was a master at mastering words. Seldom when a critical, unless it was necessary in his job, which it sometimes was, but an unnecessarily critical word would come from his mouth. It wasn't because he didn't feel like the rest of us. You know what he often did? Often he wrote down. He'd write long letters to some of the commanders that he was completely frustrated with. And then he'd burn them. I, 
That's a fantastic strategy. Put your indignation where it belongs, in the fire. All of us could take a lesson there, couldn't we? We've, we've heard it said we often give people a piece of our mind that we, they can't afford to lose. We do that, don't we? Spurgeon again. Somebody said to him, the Reverend Mr. Spurgeon is a great bag of wind. His answer was, thank you for the compliment. I'm glad to hear I'm great at anything. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer, how you ought to answer each person. I mean, let's be an example of that, right? Be an example in speech. Then he says, I want you to be an example in conduct. If you want others to act Christian, you're going to have to act Christian, right? It's not a, for a leader, it's not a do as I say, but not as I do world. It's a do as I do world. I have a nephew, Michael. He's a wonderful young man. I hate to think how much he's moving up that age chain, but when he was just a little boy, his mom and dad put new sheets on his bed. They were big Mickey Mouse sheets. They thought he would love them. He took one look at, the, at those big mice and said he wasn't going to get in there for anything. Scared him to death. They cajoled. They pleaded. They did everything they could think of to get him in that bed. To no avail, he was not bedding down with those gigantic mice. It was not going to happen. Finally, as a last resort, my brother jumped in the bed, pulled the covers over his head, and began to snore away. That was all it took. Michael jumped in right behind him. The example was what he needed. The sermon wasn't going to do anything. But the example made all the difference. You know, it's great to teach Christ-likeness, and we need to do that. But if we're not living it, it's not going to work. Far better to exemplify it. Model it. And, you know, just... Just a word, this is so important with parents, right? It's not enough to say this is the right thing to do. You have to do it. It's not enough to say don't lie. You don't lie. And you realize every time you say to your child, I'm going to count to three, and if you don't do this, then this is going to happen. And then you count to, th to three, and the second time you count to three, they finally do it. You just made a promise that you broke. I see parents do this all the time. This or that's going to happen if you don't do this. And the child knows when you mean it because of the tone of your voice. Mean it the first time. I don't know. I'm on a soapbox now. Sorry. But parents, listen, kids are going to become what you are. They're going to become what you are, not what you say. That's what they're going to become. And leaders in this congregation, the congregation is, is going to become what we are. If we lack integrity, if we lack example, if we lack involvement, if we lack participation, that's the kind of congregation that we can expect. I'm going to give an example. R.C. Sproul talks about how early in his ministry, some older minister asked him, how do you see the church? Is it an army or a hospital? And Sproul was, I think he was in seminary at the time, he said, and he was, you know, filled with vim and vigor, his, going to conquer the world. And he said, well, it's, you know, it's got to be both, but I see the church primarily as an army that God has equipped to change the world, mobilized to change the world. And the older man wisely said to him, son, he said, before the church can become an army, it must become a hospital. And we should ask ourselves, is that who we are? Can we handle the people that are struggling? Can we help them? Because we have to. You know, Mar Madeline Mur Murray O'Hare, the old atheist, some of you will remember her in her heyday. She once said this. She said, the church is the only army that shoots their wounded. In other words, we're judgmental, we're self-righteous, and we shoot our wounded. Makes you wonder if somewhere along the line she didn't get shot, right? You can almost bet that she did. No ability makes up for lack of love. Turn with me to... First Corinthians, we, uh, 
This is a wedding chapter, only that's not why it was written. It was written to a church that was rife with disunity because mostly around one spiritual gift, the gift of tongues, and those who had it thought everybody should have it. And there was a lot of dysfunction going on because of that. And so Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, I mean, how can you get better than that? And have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, commendable. If I did that and don't have love, I gain nothing. So, beloved, we must, we must. It's imperative that as leaders and as followers, we teach each other how to love one another. God has given the world the right to judge us by this. So we must be examples in conduct. We must be loving conduct. Then we're to be examples in faith. Unswerving faithfulness back in 1 Timothy 3. A good leader doesn't deviate from his calling. He's committed to his mission. You know, I, I don't know what's going on in our country. God knows. My confidence is strong that God is in charge. I'll be watching this election very closely, as many of you will. Praying that God will put the people in power who will defend our Christian liberties when it's not really costing anybody else anything. And yet we have those who would take those away in the name of single individual freedoms that really are not being violated anyway. The question is, will we stay true to mission? If it, what if it goes the other way? Will we cave as many already have? Are we still faithful to the word? Will we still be faithful to the things that honor God? And let the consequences be what they will. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, verse 2, it is required of a steward that one be found faithful. We can all do better, right? We need to be like the little boy. He had seen dinner. And so when, they, when he sat down and they asked him to pray, he said, okay, but he was honest. He said, Lord, I don't like the looks of it, but I thank you for it, and I'll eat it. In some ways, that's a faithful way to live, because some of the things that God sends to us don't look very appetizing, do they? Sorry, Jerry, I should have asked if I could use you as an example, but I'm sure when you fell off in that tractor and, and got all messed up, it didn't look very appetizing. That's not something you would choose for yourself that any of us would choose. God has his purposes and he has his reasons and he's working in our lives. And our response needs to be, I don't know why this is what you're doing. It doesn't look good to me. But thank you for it. I'll eat it. I'll embrace it. I'll do what I think you want me to do. I don't know what God's going to ask us to do in our country. We don't know. We could find ourselves in some pretty hard situations. Will we be faithful? Paul says, I want you to be faithful. Then he says, I want you to be an example in purity, sexual purity. That's what the word means, chastity. We're desperate for this example. Our culture used to be based on Christian values. No longer. Our young people need examples. They need we, we have young people and elders being urged to explore anything in this area, anywhere their imagination takes them. We have, I know this will stagger some of you maybe, but we have classes in secular schools where kids are urged to go out and experiment sexually and then to make report on it, to come back and make report. And some of them who have refused to do that have been given bad grades. Some of them have gone to court about it. I mean, this is the kind of world that we live in, beloved. And Paul says, no, God's values haven't changed. You need to be an example of purity, sexual purity. 
I, I remember I have a, an uncle who had gotten divorced and he was marrying a, a wonderful Christian lady. And, and uh, I don't know if Patty will remember this, but we were at their wedding it's several years ago now. But when they got up, the pastor made note of the fact that these two people had committed themselves to not be sexually involved before they actually got married. There's a concept, isn't it? But he had to make note of it because in our society, everybody would assume that they hadn't, even in the church. You say, that's, that's too hard. That's what God asks of us, beloved. Young people, this is you. You will never regret going that way. You might regret going the other way. The examples of purity, Paul says, God hasn't changed. Sexuality can provide some of the most wonderful, beautiful, joyful moments in life. But out of, used out of the control that God has ordained for it, it burns like a fire out of control, and we need godly examples. One church I was in had a, you know, had a deacon who had a reputation. All the girls dreaded him when it came time to get married. It was a pretty big church, and we were off in these weddings, and the bridesmaids knew, they, 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 they knew at the reception that this guy was going to come through and hug everybody, and he was going to be, he was going to be hugging a little longer than appropriate until he finally had to be disciplined about that. We need leaders who are devotedly faithful to their wives. We need leaders who don't look a little too long, who don't hug a little too long who don't make suggestive remarks, who guard their thought life. We need men. <laughs> we know men are sexually stimulated visually. We know that. But this is one of the areas that is to be brought in under the control and, and to keep those fires within the bounds that God has made for them. So Paul says, I want you to be an example. Here's what he says in Ephesians 5. Let's take a look at that one, Ephesians 5. Let's turn back a little bit uses some pretty strong language here to the Ephesians. And remember, that's where Timothy is when he's writing this. So they apparently had a little bit of problem with this. They lived in a place <clears throat> which was the, where the Temple of Diana was, where men, and, men routinely went to exercise sexual, uh, sexual relations outside of marriage with the, with the uh, priestesses that were at the temple. There was, when we were at Ephesus, they showed us how from the library in town, in the middle of town, there was a secret tunnel that went underground to the brothel a couple streets down because it was this accepted thing to do. So it's no wonder Paul had to write some of these conditions, right? Here's what he says in Ephesians 5, verse 1. Let there be no filthiness. Well, he first says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. But then in verse 4, he says, let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. And you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or anyone who is covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. In the day of sexual darkness, beloved, let's be different. Let's be the examples chastity to our children, to the next generation, to others who are coming along. So this is his message to Timothy, how to lead, how to lead a congregation with authority, with confidence, with example. I saw an interview not too long ago, Troy Aikman, the old quarterback for Dallas Cowboys, was being interviewed by Joe Buck. Most of you know them as announcers together now, but Joe Buck had this show where he interviewed various, various sports figures, and he had Troy Aikman on one day, and he got him talking about his days with the Dallas Cowboys. When he came to Dallas, they were a horrible team. He just about got killed the first couple of years there. <laughs> Uh, as a quarterback, but by the time they brought new ownership in, Jerry Jones, and then he brought in <coughs> Jimmy Johnson to coach, they got better and better, and by 94 and 95, they won two consecutive Super Bowls, two years in a row. And then Johnson left. I mean, he won a Super Bowl, and he left. Why did he leave? Because he couldn't get along with Jerry Jones, and these were two guys who had been friends since college. They played football together in college, they were great friends when he first came, but all of a sudden they couldn't get along. And here's what Troy Aikman said about all this. 
He said, I can tell you with all honesty, there was never any jealousy between Michael Irvin, Emmett Smith, and me, three stars on the team, any of the guys. We sacrificed. We all gave up something to be good and to win. The two guys leading the organization, they didn't and they couldn't. And yet they were the ones telling us that that's what we needed to do. And that's the part that really bothered me. It should never have happened. He goes on. He says, I don't know how many Super Bowls we'd have won. Maybe no more. Maybe a lot more. What I know is that we would have been really good for a long time knocking on the door every year. It didn't happen because the two guys at the top couldn't lead. They couldn't be an example to the guys below them. We don't want the same thing to happen, right? We need men who will lead with confidence, with authority, with the example of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the challenge that you put before us. Guide us. Help us. We acknowledge we are imperfect. But, Lord, we also acknowledge you've given us tasks to do. You've given us the power of the Holy Spirit to work through us, to accomplish that task. And so I pray that you will give us the incentive to do that, and the will to do that. Not only that, Father, but help us primarily to be motivated by our love for you, for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the Holy Spirit who dwells within. Lord, no greater thing than to anticipate one day being able to stand before you and hear, well done good and faithful servant. He's not going to say perfectly done, but well done. Because we've given it what we had under your direction, under your power. Thank you that we can count on you when we can count on no one else. Bless us now as we sing this closing hymn and go our way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for the wonderful words of that song, how it describes the expectations and it describes our failure, but our forgiveness that's available through you and ultimately that we can succeed when it's Christ living through us. Lord, help us to do that better and better and better as the days, the weeks, the months go by, that we might represent you well, that we might provide great leadership to everyone whose life we influence. We pray this for the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God, thank you for being here. We will see you next week.